Hello, friends, and welcome to the third episode of a special Weekly Witness series introducing Texas Impact's legislative priorities for the next biennium. My name is Scott Atnip, your host and Texas Impact's Director of Public Witness, and this week we begin our series in earnest. For the remainder of the series, we plan to welcome a faith leader to help introduce a section of the legislative priorities and have a conversation about why it's an important priority for the Texas faith community. Then we'll be joined by a member of the Texas Impact team to help us prepare for the policy conversations we'll need to have leading up to the upcoming election and the legislative session. If you missed the last two episodes, go back and listen to Texas Impact staff and board members discuss Texas Impact's legislative priorities, which are a consensus set of priorities determined by almost 50 Texas Impact board members representing our member denominations and faith traditions. Uh, They talked about the legislative priority process and why it's important is they work to represent their own tradition social statements while considering the most pressing issues facing our state. And those conversations were great, but now the real work begins. It's up to each of us to study the issues and talk to our congregations and networks about speaking out on these priority issues. Check them out at texasimpact.org and share this series with your connections. Today, we'll welcome Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray, president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, and then be joined by Texas Impact's Executive Director, B. Moorhead, to kick us off by talking about maternal health and abortion access and protecting LGBT plus Texans. But before we get to that conversation, one more housekeeping matter. Texas Impact plans to provide Texas Impact members and the Weekly Witness community with opportunities to connect with other humans in real life in the weeks and months to come, starting with our Faith and Democracy Tour kicking off at in Dallas at St. Paul United Methodist Church, Sunday, September 11th at 2 o'clock. Find out more at texasimpact.org and invite your friends in the Dallas area to join. We'll have announcements soon about other tour stops coming up, so make sure that you're subscribed to the e-news and following us on all of the social media platforms. So with that, here we go. Our conversation with Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray. Joining us for today's conversation is Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray, president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. And we're going to be talking today about two really important issues in Texas Impact's legislative priorities, issues that the Unitarian Universalists have been working on for years. So today's episode is focusing on Texas Impact's legislative priorities related to protecting minority communities. And under that category, the legislative priorities speak to protecting privacy, bodily autonomy, and family autonomy of any Texan, including women seeking reproductive health care or abortion, trans people seeking gender-affirming care, and LGBTQ plus folks. So, Susan, I know these have been uh, really important issues to y'all, and I'm really thankful for you joining us today to be a part of this conversation. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you, Scott. And I'm, I'm grateful for the work of Texas Impact. I appreciate that. It's a it's a wonderful partnership, and we appreciate uh, your leadership um, at the national level. So let let's jump right in and and talk some about uh, the Unitarian Universalist Association for folks who might not uh, be familiar. But uh, you lead an association of more than a thousand congregations, and these are congregations that at the forefront have justice and equity, um, really kind of front and center in your ministry. So can you start off the conversation today by talking about the Unitarian Universalist Association, um, and then tell us some about your priority for engaging in justice and advocacy ministries? Why is this so important to y'all? Yeah, absolutely. So the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, is the central organization for the Unitarian Universalist religious movement, largely in the United States, but not exclusively. Our over 1,000 member congregations are autonomous congregations, but they join together in the membership of the UUA. And so the UUA does things like credentials ministers and religious leaders. It provides services to congregations, including religious education, curriculum, and we also publish. So that's sort of our work. One of the things about Unitarian Universalists is that we are not creedal. 
We don't all believe the same thing, but we do hold seven principles, our sort of core ethical values in common. And these include the worth and dignity of every person, the need for justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, and the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process, both in our congregations, but in the world at large. And so, you know, I think it's really the seven principles that drive um, our commitments around justice. And one of the things about being non-credal is that we all, all don't believe the same thing, including about what happens after we die. But we care about the here and now, and we care about the conditions of justice and the conditions of care for all people right here in this life, here and now. And so that drives our um, our commitments to justice. And it's why justice is so important to Unitarian Universalists and to our congregations. And for me, one of the things that I've been deeply focused on in the in my presidency is number one, democracy, because we yes. have seen that consistently under attack across our country. So I'm happy to talk more about that. And then human rights. And I, and I just want to connect these things a bit that we're going to talk about these issues later. But when we see our, our government, um, whether it's our state or our county or our city or our, or our federal government attacking people, like really um, marginalizing people based on identity, those kinds of tactics have always been used to undermine democracy and to undermine the quality of community and for people, you know, people's ability to work together for the betterment of all, for the uh, support of healthy communities. So I just, I want to connect those things. Like we're in a really dangerous moment, seeing people's rights being curtailed, seeing their identities being attacked. And we have seen that in across the world. They are tactics of growing authoritarianism um, and incredibly dangerous. So those are real priorities for me. Well, I love those priorities and appreciate you sharing them with us. Uh, so our listeners are, are predominantly people of faith, and I think we'll all understand <laughs> uh, your idea that uh, we don't all agree on everything, right? And right. and um, certainly that is that is true in most of our local congregations, especially if we extend that out to a thousand different congregations. But I was really interested in reading a recent piece that that you um, you published in Religion Dispatch. It, um, in the religion dispatches where, where you talked about the idea that 90 plus percent of Unitarian Universalists um, agree with the idea that we should have uh, access to abortion rights um, and reproductive health uh, in, in most cases, or if not all cases, that that, that same percentage, 90 plus percent, uh, believed that we should have anti-discrimination legislation for the LGBT community. And so there was certainly a lot of agreement, not unanimity, but a lot of agreement among your members on those two issues. And so you used that agreement to make the case that that this was more than just uh, support for those issues, but it was a religious freedom issue that we needed to be mm -hmm. thinking about. So can you can you talk to us some about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, the Public Religion Research Institute found out that. 97% of Unitarian Universalists support non-discrimination protections for LGBTQIA+, and over 90% support access to legal abortion in most cases. So I do, I argue that if like, if that, that percentage over, you know, 97% in one case support a particular view on things that you can call that a part of our fundamental teaching. And it, and it is, I mean, in, we are committed to creating inclusive, welcoming communities. We teach age appropriate, comprehensive sexuality education to our youth. And it, includes the affirmation and celebration of a spectrum of gender identity and sexual orientation. So this is part of what we teach our families, what we teach our young people. Um, it, is, it is foundational. And so it is a part of our religious beliefs. It's part of how we raise our kids and how we nurture spiritual community. So when the government, when Governor Abbott or the Attorney General in Texas say that um, providing trans affirming health care and allowing that in a family, supporting that in a family is child abuse. Like this is dangerous. It not only threatens the um, 
children from being taken from their parents, but it is fundamentally the government intervening in how parents raise their children and how religious communities affirm and support the children and families of their communities. So for example, I mean, in that, in those policies, it calls for doctors and professionals to report if they know something like this, that puts ministers um, potentially in a position of having to um, disclose or, or put their families at risk because um, the ministers are aware of the children's health care. So this is fundamentally a violation of religious freedom. You know, it's one thing in the... It, Churches don't all have to agree, but we have to have the freedom to practice our beliefs. And in our communities, in UU communities, we practice welcome and inclusion for all our folks, regardless of gender identity, regardless of sexual orientation. We think the diversity of identity is a spiritual gift, is something that's beautiful, the diversity of humanity in that way, gender and sexuality. We celebrate it. We affirm it. And for the government to say that that's abuse is fundamentally a violation of our religious freedom. And mm. all religious people should care about this. All okay. religious people should care about the government intervening in how parents raise their kids um, and how churches uh, support their families and kids. Amen. I think that it, that's an important argument to make. Uh, yes. I, I do want to I want to turn to a couple of the issues that we're going to talk about today because the, the two issues we brought you to talk about have been considered hot button issues for a lot of congregations, a lot of people um, over the course of, of time. And it, it is good to see that congregations and people of faith are starting to speak out on these issues where maybe the religious right has has uh, has been making a, a strong argument for decades. Uh, but I, I, I'd love it if you could help us put kind of a faith argument on to some of these issues, starting with uh, abortion and access to reproductive health. Uh, why is protecting women's access to abortion and reproductive health care an issue that people of faith specifically should care about? Yeah. So the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, along with a lot of other religious denominations, believes that health care is a human right. And reproductive care is health care. Fundamentally, reproductive care, including access to abortion, is health care. And so a lot of religious communities know that health care is a fundamental human right. Because how can life thrive without having access to health care, right? And we... Um, we rec we see the pandemic. The pandemic has been devastating. But one of the one of the things it showed us is that when inequality is at the foundation of our society and people are left behind, that it puts everyone more at risk. The United States led so many countries in the rate of COVID infection and COVID deaths. Over a million Americans died from COVID. And that is, you know, a huge part of that was having a healthcare system that was built on profit and not built on public health. So I just want to reiterate that as religious people, I think we, we know so many of us are committed to the fact that healthcare is a human right and reproductive care, including access to abortion is healthcare. And it is also a fundamental right. So, you know, as Unitarian Universalists, we are committed to the framework of reproductive justice. This was a framework that was created by Black women in the 1980s and 1990s, and it affirms the human right to have children, to not have children, and to parent the children that one has in healthy environments, to safeguard bodily autonomy, and to express sexuality freely. So we affirm that framework, and um, as a pastor... Well, well, first of all, before I go in there, I just say one of the reasons we that this framework is so important, reproductive justice, is because it is a reminder that the people who are most impacted by these abortion bans are going to be people of color, poor people, people living in rural areas, people, disabled people, folks who already struggle to have equitable access to fundamental health care, including reproductive care. We have an abysmal rate of infant mortality and maternal mortality when it comes to um, pregnancy and delivery. It, 
we have an abysmal rate for being the United States and so, you know a developed country. And that again is the is because people don't have access to comprehensive reproductive care. Now I want to just um, lift up that as a pastor, I have um, counseled folks uh, who are considering abortion. I have worked in hospitals providing counseling, spiritual counseling to people who are receiving abortions. And I was raised by a mother who was a nurse and who worked in labor and delivery. And from all of these experiences, I know how critical abortion is, that it is actually about well-being and health for individuals, for women, for their families. And so to me, um, reproductive care, as well as access to abortion is an issue of health and well-being. It's about people's well-being. It's about their lives. It's about their wholeness. And so I would hope that all people of faith, regardless of their particular beliefs about um, abortion, would approach this issue with compassion and care. Because the issues related to pregnancy, to having children, to choosing not to have children, these are deeply personal um, issues, deeply private issues. And um, these kinds of bans from the government are absolutely deadly. Because again, abortion care is a part of reproductive care. It is a part of health care. And we need to protect health care as a fundamental human right for all people. You mentioned a couple of times uh, about being a pastor, and I appreciate you sharing mm-hmm. your experiences there. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like <laughs> friends in Texas who are listening might need a bit of a pastoral word right now. Mm-hmm. And so I, I wonder if there's anything you, you'd say to, to folks here in Texas who are living in, I think it's fair to say, a more hostile environment on this topic than many others in the country. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, my husband is a Texan born and raised. Most of his family still lives in Texas. I think of them all the time as I watch the news unfold and we talk with them. And I'm a Missourian. So right (laughs) Right. now my husband and I live in Massachusetts, but I'm from Missouri and all my family is in Missouri. So So you feel um, us. Yeah. yeah, And before like the majority of my husband and I ministry, he's also a pastor. We did our ministry in Arizona. So we, you know, these are communities that we're familiar with. And I, you know, I know how hard it is to to fight for democracy, for human rights, for progressive values in these red states. And um, I know that um, it can it can be uh, scary and depressing. Um, but I've also seen success and I want to lift up Kansas, right? I want to lift up what just happened in Kansas not too long ago, right? When, you know, a huge number, a shocking number of people showed up to vote in this uh, election, you know, not a presidential election to protect access to abortion. Like that is inspiring. And I know that that kind of passion and energy and commitment to protecting human rights, to protecting reproductive freedom, that that is alive in Texas. I know it is alive in Arizona. I know it is alive all across the country. So that's one thing I want to say. And and I want to just say how important it is to keep fighting, to keep fighting. Like I was a part of the campaigns against... Um, Sheriff Joe Arpaio in Arizona and his human rights abuses. And it took 20 years, right? But the people were able to defeat him at the polls. So I just, you know, people, we are powerful. I want us to remember how much power we have. And the other thing I want to say to my friends, neighbors who are in blue states, I think sometimes I hear like, well, you know, at least we're in a blue state and, you know, folks in red states can do what they want to do. But I want to be really clear that that um, a lot of, you know, Texas is a voter suppression state, right? A lot of these states, Missouri is a gerrymandered state. Wisconsin is a gerrymandered state. Mm. At, like so many states that are passing these restrictive, inhumane, draconian laws are also voter suppression states. And so it, like, 
And democracy, when democracy is so under attack and threatened, it matters to all Americans. So I really want to encourage folks living in blue states to send money and support and resources to organizers and grassroots communities and faith communities who are on the ground working to change the policies in, in these red states. It is so critical that we understand ourselves in partnership and solidarity and not leave people behind. And that's been a part of our success. I want to you know, in 2020, Unitarian Universalists launched this program called You, You, the Vote, mm -hmm. um, because we knew we knew how much democracy is, was on the line in 2020. Right. We saw the rise of authoritarianism, which we have not fully confronted. Want to be clear, it's not over. But um, we launched this massive effort and Unitarian Universalists contacted over 3 million voters. And we did that in partnership with grassroots communities, with directly impacted communities. I really wanna lift up for faith leaders out there. One of the things that's so important is as faith communities, I. I think we always have one foot in the status quo, right? We have we have uh, tax protections, right? We um, we you know we're just a part of communities, right? Where we have buildings and we we help provide services. There's all these ways in which we're you know in which we're deeply embedded in the community um, in, and in the status quo, I would say. But the other foot, we need to have it aligned and in solidarity with those most directly impacted by injustice, right. because those are the people who know what greater equity, what greater justice, what freedom looks like. So you, you the vote was a nonpartisan effort that was working with grassroots communities that were working to just turn out the vote in communities that are largely ignored by the established uh, political structures. So, you know, you, the vote's nonpartisan, but we can work on issues and there's a lot of issues to work on in the states. And so I'm just excited because I think that we, we're in a critical moment and the, the significance of the moment also provides an opportunity to really, um, to really fight for the future we need, right? Right. <clears throat> Well, let me get to one of those other issues that we want to make sure that we cover today. It's an issue that's been a hot topic for congregations uh, for years as well, and that's support for the LGBTQIA community. And I know in terms of our listeners, many mobilized, many congregations here in Texas mobilized for the first time on this issue in 2017 uh, to defeat Texas's uh, discriminatory bathroom bill that had been proposed. And uh, I, I think, speaking for myself and maybe Texas Impact, uh, I, I think communities of faith take, can take a lot of credit uh, for defeating those bills because congregations and people of faith did turn up in big ways. And it seemed like as, as soon as that session ended in 2017, they, they shifted the focus uh, specifically to trans kids and their parents. And you've yeah. mentioned some of that in the open. Um, so I wonder if you can speak to Texans of Faith about why you think it's important, especially that, that we engage uh, to make sure that those kids and their families are protected. Yeah. I mean, first, it's important to protect trans kids and their families because it is the right thing to do. You're right. It is the just thing to do, right? We are all as faith communities, we care about protecting kids, right? And so this is this is so important. I also want to name that these transphobic policies endanger the lives of trans kids and trans young people. They yes. absolutely endanger the lives of these young people. It makes targets of them. Um, it creates conditions that we already see, which is higher rates of suicide among trans young people and also higher rates of violence, of acts of violence against trans people. And that is especially severe um, among trans women of color. And we've seen that rise over the last few years. So I just, you know, these, these transphobic policies that target people, they, they endanger people. Folks are... Folks, is, folks take their own lives or are hurt or killed by others because of these policies. So, and I think many people of faith understand the importance of love, right? And the importance of welcoming people and, and know the dangers of these kinds of laws. So that's number one, why I think we should care about this work and work hard to protect trans kids and families. As Unitarian Universalists, we value sexual, the diversity of sexuality and gender as a spiritual gift. Uh, we work hard ourselves to create religious communities. And I wanna go back, well, we can talk more about that, but you know, we, we value the diversity of sexuality and gender and see it as a spiritual gift. 
and work hard to create inclusive communities. Love it. Um, so is there anything uh, the UUA is, is currently working on in, in terms of protecting the trans community? Absolutely. So first of all, we are working in partnership with organizations like the Trevor Project, but, but other organizations in exploring legal options in response to these devastating laws. So this includes amicus briefs or and or being plaintiffs in particular cases that are aimed to overturn these laws. So there's, there's a legal approach that we are working on in partnership, uh, again, with communities that are really and organizations that are focused on these issues. But secondly, for decades and decades, Unitarian Universalist congregations have been creating welcoming communities for LGBTQIA people, children, and their families. So we proudly teach our kids, as I said, age-appropriate, comprehensive sexual education that affirms the spectrum of sexual orientation and gender identity. Our program, OWL, Our Whole Lives, done in conjunction with the UCC United Church of Christ, teaches our kids about bodily autonomy, agency, consent, healthy, respectful relationships, and agency. And so I just, I think this is the most important thing we do on this issue, right? because we are teaching um, our communities about um, inclusion and welcoming, and we're helping our kids celebrate who they are and know they are loved for all of who they are. And that's, you know, that to me is the most important thing uh, we do. And that curriculum, OWL, it actually shows up in other places. Like it is, it helps to inform um you know, sex education curriculum age appropriate that's offered in other communities. And so I just think that kids need to be knowledgeable about this. They need to have the, the facts and the words. And I actually, you know, even as president of the UUA, I've had young adults come up to me and tell me that OWL saved their lives. Wow that it saved their lives, that it helped them understand the things they were going through. It helped them under, have words for their experiences and it helped them feel loved as they were, you know, coming out or, um, you know, or just building relationships that are, have a foundation of respect and consent and care. And so, um, I'm just so proud of that work. And I think it's, it, um, is, has made a huge difference in our communities, but beyond as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for that important uh, ministry, that important witness. Uh, Susan, the, the issues we've talked about today have been hard. Yeah. <laughs> and the, there is a lot going on in the world that has people uh, scared, that has people nervous, um, all of the things. And so I wonder if yeah. before we close, if you can leave us with a word of hope. Yeah. Yeah. May we remember that we are powerful. The chaotic nature of our politics, the disinformation, the perpetual crisis, all of this is meant to make us feel exhausted and confused so that we check out. So, you know, one of the things I have learned through a lot of years of organizing and ministry is that hope is in the struggle. That the times I feel the most hopeful are when I'm on the line talking to a voter or when I'm on the street with a grassroots organization in a march or when I'm door knocking. Like it is in the struggle. It is in the work that we can see the future, that we can feel the hope of what's possible. So I just, you know, be in the struggle. That's actually how you find hope is doing the work and doing it in partnership with others. We are powerful. We have everything we need. We can organize for the future we all need. And we have seen wins. We see wins in Kansas. We saw wins in 2020. Like we know the power that we have when we use it. So that's what I want to say is like one foot forward, you know, or, or one move forward, one call, then another call to another voter. Like however you want to get involved, maybe you bring meals to people who are organizing and out on the streets, but like find your place and do the work, um, find the work that matches the skills you have, because there is hope in the struggle. There is hope in working with others for a better future for us all. Don't give up. Amen. Reverend Dr. <laughs> Susan Frederick Gray, I, uh, I was at a church preaching this Sunday, so I feel like I didn't get to listen to a sermon, but I feel like I have now and I'm ready for the week. So thank you. Uh, thank You're you for the welcome. time. Thank you for that word. Any, any shameless plugs you want to leave us with today? 
Absolutely. Well, first of all, UU The Vote, the nonpartisan initiative, you can find out more at uuthevote.org. And you don't have to be a UU to participate. We do phone banks. We do all kinds of ways to turn out voters um, across the country. Also, a number of our states have UU state action networks. So I want to lift up the Texas UU Justice Ministry. You can find out more at txuujm.org, uh, Texas UU Justice Ministry. They are fabulous. And then, of course, if you're interested in learning more about Unitarian Universalism, I welcome you to check out UUA.org, visit one of our congregations nearby, um, and just wish many blessings to everyone today. Well, Susan, thank you again for the time. We certainly have work to do, and I appreciate you uh, getting us ready to go do that work. Glad to be here with you, Scott. Thank you for the work of Texas Impact. This week's episode was brought to you by Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas, Friendship West Baptist Church in Dallas, and the COVID Collaborative. Joining us today is Texas Impact's Executive Director, B. Moorhead. Hey, B. glad to have you with us. Hey, Scott. I'm glad to be here. When we laid out this uh, series of episodes, um, Really started off with the easy ones, right? With uh, <laughs> maternal health, abortion <laughs> access, and LGBT issues. Uh, just jumping right into the easy stuff, right? Sure, yeah. And the things that we have the longest track record on, too. Uh, not. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, you did just have a chance uh, to listen to, to our conversation with with Susan. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Oh, man, so many thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I just, I have to say... It was really poignant for me listening to her because, as you know, she and her husband actually, she mentioned that they had been, they spent a good bit of time in Arizona, but uh, before they were in Arizona, they were in Kent, Ohio. Ah, uh, you they know were, something about that place. They were, in fact, they were at my parents, in my parents' community, and her husband, Brian, was my parents' associate pastor at their UCC church, and so... It was it was a poignant feeling for me of being connected to my parents and hearing her say things that I knew they would have been they would have found so affirming. Right. And I just want to say, I mean, you and I talk about this from time to time, but one of the really miraculous things about this whole environment of faith and the faith communities that we work in is how it connects people across space and across time. Right. And and gives us that feeling of of being in relationship with people who are maybe no longer with us but are still tied to us through that that connection of faith. And I just want to say I think that in fact that is one of the most important things about what Texas Impact brings to the policy discussion. Groups like Texas Impact bring not just the views of current ardent participants, but they bring with them that whole what we call the great cloud of witnesses, right? The All of the people, past, present, and future, who all affirm their connection to each other and their common purpose for the beloved community, the greater good here in our little blue planet. So it, it was just a really, it was kind of a, a kind of a moment for me, honestly, to hear her speak. I love that. So. I love that. Uh, anything on uh, her content that, that really stood out to you? Yeah. I mean, there were a couple of things. One of them was that she just went right immediately into Attacking vulnerable people is not just a question of not loving our neighbor, right? She's attacking vulnerable people hurts democracy for everyone. And I particularly appreciated, you know, she said she's in Massachusetts and, you know, we, we know people in Massachusetts who, who are saying right now, thank goodness we're in Massachusetts, not fill in the blank red state. And how she she said that that her her charge to people in States like Massachusetts is you don't get a pass just because things are going great for you right now. You need to find ways to be in relationship and work with people in, 
you know, she said in red states, you know, in places where there are challenges. And again, I mean, not to like beat it over the head, but the faith community is absolutely constructed for that kind of cooperative, co-supportive activity. So it was really, uh, really important that she started that way, especially given the topics that we're talking about today, which are, you know, just the the absolute bleeding edge of conflict in Texas and our country. Yeah, so let's dive in on a couple of those issues, the, the issues we're talking about today. And, and so folks know during this series, we're going to have a faith leader each week who lays out uh, the case for uh, people of faith engaging on these important issues, and and Susan did a great job of of talking about both maternal health and access to abortion um, and LGBT issues as a justice issue. Uh, but the second part is going to talk about the specific policies that we need to be preparing for and and talking to our legislators about. Uh, and it, unless people have been living in a bubble and only listening to this podcast maybe over the course of the last few weeks, uh, folks have definitely heard of the Dobbs decision, and my guess is many people listening have feelings about that. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk in the news about possible federal responses. But this podcast focuses on the Texas legislature and what people can do here in the great state of Texas. Uh, so with that lens in mind, uh, what should advocates be preparing for as the as this election season and, and the 2023 legislature approaches? Well, I mean, I think the the so thinking about the election season, we're about to start at Labor Day, the sort of official election season. I think people should be more than ever challenging candidates publicly to say specifically what they what they will do how they will make choices and not to just you know would you yes or no vote for a particular piece of legislation but how will you make those decisions how will you take into account your constituents, what will be the role of big donors in your decision-making process? All of those things. I mean, don't let candidates off the hook. They are applying for a really big job. If you were applying for a job where you got to make all the rules about all the ways everyone in your community lives their life— you would feel that you needed to prepare really hard and have some really good answers at that interview. This is a job interview. Anytime you go to a town hall meeting, the person you're coming to see is not an entertainer. If you want to be entertained, you should go to, you know, a, a music festival in your town or go see a movie. The person who is on the stage with the microphone is the candidate for a job and you're hiring them. So it is time for you to get really serious with those candidates about how they will fit into our organization, which is the community we live in, right? How will you bring value to our community? One of the obvious questions is going to be about reproductive issues how how if a candidate can't say anything more than uh you know my faith tells me or uh i've been a i've been a lifelong whichever thing that's not responsive to questions about what do you know about the healthcare system in our local community, how what the profile is of people who have and have not sought abortions in our community, what's it like here for people with children that they did or did not choose to have. The, there's there are serious substantive questions that Texans need to be asking candidates, and it's pretty high stakes. This is a job that it's really hard to get. A lot of people want to be an elected official, and most people don't ever get to do it. 
Once you get that job, it's really hard to fire people. Once they're there, it's very likely they will be there till they decide to move on. So you have one chance to get it right. So don't don't soft pedal it because you hate to be that guy who asked the hard question in public. Yeah. And this is the first time this issue has uh, arise, has been on Texas Impact's list of legislative priorities. And so it's a new issue uh, for us. But I feel like it may be right or wrong for a lot of people during previous legislative sessions. Um, they have they felt like they could sit this issue out because many of the things that, that would be passed would have been struck down by the Supreme Court. Right. And, and that's not real this time. So um, how... How do you hope people will prepare as we move into the legislative session uh, to talk about some of these things? Well, you know, it's an interesting point that you make. So now, now that Dobbs has been decided, there is a little bit of uh, revision of history going on, I think, where people are saying, well, we didn't say anything about it just because... We thought the Supreme Court would take care of it. We thought there would be these guardrails. But but that's not my memory. My memory is the reason that the faith communities, and I've been doing this job now for a really long time, you know, 20, 22 years. The faith communities didn't want to talk about this issue, one, because they were not confident that their own members were were of one mind or even of a few really closely related minds, right? They didn't, they didn't believe that there was much, uh, much in common in among their own members. And two, they didn't want to cause conflict with faith communities that they knew did have strong positions that were not, what they suspected a lot of their people would agree with. So let me just say that very plainly. A lot of mainline Protestant denominations, um, the Jewish community, lots of people within other faith traditions hung back on the issue of abortion because they knew that parts of the evangelical community and the official hierarchy of the Catholic Church had very strong, very black and white positions on very clearly articulated positions on the issue. And they didn't want to cause strife. And the common thing that we talked about was there when there are so many things we agree on, Right, so over and over again came this idea that when there are so many issues we agree on and people could point to, but we all are working together on feeding hungry people. We all want to work together on meeting needs after disasters. We all care about, you know, right down the line, right? And even some of the things that Texas Impact works on where... Uh, you know, climate change is a, a probably a, a sterling example where the Catholic Church, which obviously sets the the far right bar on on reproductive issues, but uh, historically a leader on climate issues. So the the Pope has made really important statements on, and not just the current Pope, but every Pope since uh, since you and I have been alive has said important things about the climate and the creation. So there's not, it, it's not that in the Presbyterian church, the Methodist church, the Lutheran church, the Unitarians, the Jewish community, it's not that everybody thought we see this as a religious freedom issue. Right. And actually what you're pointing to is, I mean, the way the two things are connected the reproductive issues and the LGBT issues and what's happened, I think, in the faith community's understanding of its role in these social policy and and uh, really divisive issues. We didn't say Texas Impact didn't say anything about LGBT issues when I first started working here either. And at some point, the move that our 
own members made and the demand that they made was this is a religious freedom issue for us. It is not okay for people who have one religious orientation, one religious view to go to the legislature and impugn the motives and values of anyone who believes anything different. I mean, Josh can tell you, and I know does often, that one of the one of the most poignant moments for him in his job, I think, has been listening to a pastor testifying in a Senate hearing and saying something about the values of Christians. And he said, but I mean real Christians, not Methodists and Presbyterians. And we were like... Hey, hang uh, on, hang on. So, um, and for any listeners who doubt it, we've got that clip on our Ledge TV YouTube channel. But so on the LGBT issue in 2017, I think it was a breaking point where people, you know, all of our denominations have been through this, you know, angst and sorry to kind of use a, a hip term like angst. I know for you right now in the Methodist church, this is absolutely miserable. Yeah, I've heard rumors about that. I know, I know. But but you will get through it, and we all did too. And when you come out on the other side, it will make Methodists like it has made Lutherans and Presbyterians and UCC and everybody else much more strident about saying, you don't get to tell me what my faith says should be public policy. I have views and they're not the same as yours. And that's what we mean by separation of church and state is that no one faith orientation gets to make policy for everybody around things that are issues of personal belief. We got there in 2017 on LGBT issues I think we got there in 2022 on abortion. All right. Before we close out, I do want to ask uh, on LGBT issues. And I think last legislative session, it, the debate largely focused on whether or not trans kids could play sports in school. Um, anything you're expecting that we should be preparing for in 2023? I think that the trans sports thing was a a. I don't want to say a red herring because I know that it has caused real uh, pain for people. But I think it is a way of keeping everyone's attention on a thing that's easy to say, trans sports, while the real the real damage is going on in other areas of public policy. I think the, the areas a lot have to do on the case of trans issues with family law. So what parent what decisions parents can and can't make about their children uh what care families can receive the whole thing of of characterizing gender affirming care as child abuse those are not transports almost sounds like oh well we could agree to disagree or whatever i mean people who don't pay a ton of attention to policy can quickly hear that and think it must not be that big of a thing because sports, how big of a thing can it be? The real thing is, can your kids be taken away from you? Can your family be ruined? Can can parents and children be traumatized for the rest of their lives? Those are the issues. So I think what people who, I know what you, I know what you really wanted me to talk about was what's coming up in the legislative session. Um, on abortion issues, we think what's coming down the pike is legislation that would cut off systematically strategies that people and organizations, including faith communities, are developing to deal with a post-Roe environment. So preventing people from traveling, preventing businesses from paying for care for their employees, including paying for them to travel, penalizing people who are not health professionals who interact with people who might be seeking an abortion. What Susan Frederick Gray said about, you know, pastoral counseling, 
pastors could become nervous about talking to congregation members who or non-congregation members, people who come in off the street and say, I really need help. Um, and I don't know about you, but I mean, I've definitely been the person when, who walked into my church in a state of severe distress. In my case, it was because I had just found out a friend was dying. But I walked in. I didn't get to make a lot of choices about, is now a good time? Should I talk to this pastor? Imagine all the people who have really traumatic experiences who need to feel that they can walk in a house of worship, talk to a member of the clergy, and there won't be ramifications for them. Imagine if those clergy say, well, I don't know. I'm going to need you to fill out a form. Mm -hmm. That That's not going to work. So on abortion, I think it's those issues. On the trans issues specifically, I think it's going to happen in family law. And I think there people need to be paying close attention to stuff that might look boring or complicated at first the first blush. I think I think there is enormous damage that can be done in some committees that normally everybody says, "Ugh, that's just lawyers." All right. Well, B, thanks for the time today, uh, friends. Uh, we have some homework, uh, so let's let's get to it. But B, thanks again for the time. I want to thank our guests today, Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray and B. Moorhead. But I especially want to thank you for tuning in. And I hope you'll plan on tuning in and sharing the series with your friends and networks. We're excited both about the guests we have joining us and the content we'll cover in the coming weeks. And remember, the goal of this series is to have Texans of Faith consider our priorities and give you the tools to have conversations with your representatives and candidates for office about these priorities. Y'all, this is an important time for Texas. It seems like every day there's a new issue. But for today, pick one and start there. We'll have a series of priorities in the coming weeks, and I hope you'll pick one or two that you really care about and engage with your congregation and representatives on that issue. But Texans of Faith, now is the time to engage, and we hope Weekly Witness is a tool for you to do so in a meaningful way. If you have questions or suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at scott at texasimpact.org. And leave us a rating or review and leave a comment for us in the feed. We want to hear from you, and we want even more people to find us. So work that algorithm with your likes, shares, retweets, comments, and more. And y'all, I think that's about enough Weekly Witness for this week. So we will catch you again next week. Uh, between now and then, make sure you've subscribed to the podcast and check to make sure you and your congregation are members of Texas Impact by going to texasimpact.org. Uh, and make sure you've subscribed to our social media feeds so you can keep up to date on upcoming events like Texas Impact's Faith and Democracy series. Friends, summer is about over. The kids are back in school. Now's the time to plug back in. The world needs Texans of Faith active and engaged. So let's get to work. <music> Weekly Witness is hosted by Scott Atnett, engineered and produced by David Fasalo. Our executive producer is B. Moorhead. The opinions expressed on Weekly Witness are those of Texas Impact and our guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of our sponsors. Weekly Witness is a product of Texas Impact, people of faith working for justice. Visit us online at texasimpact.org.